uh, with APCO uh, from APCO Worldwide. Uh, and I want to welcome everybody to a, another Bras the Breakfast, yet again in the afternoon, but uh, nonetheless, the Bras the Breakfast. I want to especially welcome uh, Admiral Levine uh, to, this, uh, to this event uh, as a fellow Pennsylvanian. It was great to see her appointment, uh, nomination and appointment to this position. Um, I've always thought that Pennsylvanians bring a an uncommon common sense to whatever they do, uh, no matter what the job is. And so therefore, like I said, it was, it was a real pleasure to, and, and to see. Uh, I also want to welcome our media attendees. I've said it before, I will say it again. Uh, I just think that uh, a well-informed media, APCO strong believer that a well-informed media is uh, really a pillar and strength for a, a strong democracy. So welcome to you. And uh, once again, thanks for your participation. I'm now gonna turn over to my colleague and friend, Sarah Dash. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bill, and to you and your colleagues at APCO. And good afternoon, everybody. It is such a pleasure to be back with you today. Um, again, um, if this is your first time at uh, an Alliance event or reporter briefing, welcome. We are a nonpartisan resource for the policy community dedicated to advancing knowledge and understanding of health policy issues. And it's, it's a pleasure to uh, partner with APCO to um, bring you this conversation today. And we're incredibly honored uh, to be joined by Admiral and Dr. Rachel Levine, who is the Assistant Secretary for Health at the US Department of Health and Human Services, where she works to improve the health and well-being of all Americans. She is working to help our nation overcome the COVID-19 pandemic and build a stronger foundation for a healthier future, one in which every American can attain their full health potential. Dr. Levine's storied career, first in academic medicine, and then as a physician, uh, as, as Pennsylvania's physician general, and then as Pennsylvania's secretary of health, has focused on the intersection between mental health and physical health, often treating children, adolescents, and young adults. Um, and so timely today, we're going to begin today's conversation with the fireside chat, and then Admiral Levine will take your questions. We are on the record today. Uh, this session is being recorded. Um, and when we get to the Q&A portion of the program, you can use the um, hand raise button at the bottom of your Zoom window to ask a question. And when that's selected, you'll be placed in a queue. Of course, as always, um, if you're experiencing any challenges, you can use the chat and um, we'll ask that you please state your name and the um, or organization that you work for, your affiliation before you ask your question. So um, again, thank you. Um, so Admiral Levine, welcome. And it's such a pleasure to, to be here with you today. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's really wonderful to be here. Thank you. So can you begin uh, by sharing about, you know, how do you see your work as Assistant Secretary really fitting in with the work of HHS and, 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 and what's really essential um, to you in carrying out this role? Well, thank you for that question. You know, so as the Assistant Secretary for Health, um, one of my most important roles is to provide um, public health and medical and scientific advice to the Secretary. Um, and uh, in addition, we oversee um, a number of different offices, including uh, an office, the Office of Minority Health, the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV Policy, uh, the Office of Population Affairs, um, Research Protections, a whole, whole range of different offices, including our regional offices. And then finally, um, uh, I am the head of the uh, Public Health Service uh, Commission Corps, and those dedicated 6,000 officers. So uh, it is a wide ranging position. You know, the, uh, the, the chief of staff has called uh, the, uh, the assistant secretary for health, the connective tissue of the department. And I take that role, I take that as a compliment and I take it very seriously about uh, coordinating and helping uh, convene the different divisions within HHS. Great, thank you so much, Admiral Levine. And since you, you mentioned, you know, the, the US Public Health Service Commissioned Corps and, um, for, for those who, uh, for those in the audience who may have been with us right before the, the sort of pandemic emergency was declared, Admiral Brejoir was here, also talked about the Commission Corps. Um, we're, we're here now in the sort of hopefully later innings of this, um, this awful pandemic. Can you talk, Admiral Levine, about what role the um, Commission Corps has played um, during the course of this, of this pandemic? Well, I, I'm always very pleased to talk about the offices of the Public Health Service Commission Corps. As you know, it is one of the nation's eight uniformed services. Uh, it is not an armed service, uh, but like NOAA, it's one of the uniformed services. 
Uh, it is housed under the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and I work really closely uh, with uh, Vice Admiral Murthy, our Surgeon General, and our uh, other great uh, flag officers in the Corps um, uh, to, uh, to lead those officers. You know, the, the 6,000 officers have many different um, details. Uh, they work at the Indian Health Service. They work at the, um, uh, at the United States federal uh, prisons. Uh, they, they work for NIH and for FDA and CDC, et cetera. And then they have deployments. Uh, when the secretary and the assistant secretary for health and the surgeon general uh, need them. And that includes, of course, COVID-19. Um, and uh, we have had um, really thousands of officers that have been deployed on many, many missions uh, to support COVID-19. They have been deployed for clinical care um, in, in hospitals and in clinics, and they've been deployed for public health um, service work. Uh, and when I was in Pennsylvania, we had Commission Corps officers that came to help us with our public health work. They also have been deployed for other missions, including um, at the border, including in Operation Allies Welcome for um, Afghanistan refugees, uh, and then to serve um, with, um, with emergencies such as flooding and hurricanes and tornadoes. So there's so many ways that our Commission Corps officers serve. Thank you so much. We have certainly learned the, the intersection between you know, public health and, and, and national emergencies and national security emergencies, um, if, if nothing else, in the last couple of years. Um, so, so more broadly, as Assistant Secretary for Health, can you share where, what do you see as, as maybe your top three priorities? Mm -hmm. Well, so uh, first I'm going to mention COVID-19, uh, and then I'll have three other priorities. So COVID-19 clearly remains the biggest public health crisis that we face in the United States and globally and has seen uh, in, a in over 100 years. Um, and uh, we have made such progress with our safe and effective vaccinations, but we're not done yet. So we have to continue to work on the distribution and administration of our safe and effective vaccines. And it's tremendously exciting as a pediatrician to see that that includes children now, uh, 5 to 11, as well as uh, teens 12 through 17. And so we're working uh, with the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family Physicians, pharmacies, our um, community health centers, et cetera, to distribute these vaccinations now, including children. Um, Health equity is another of one of our priorities. It's one of the priorities of Secretary Becerra. It's one of my priorities as the ASH. Uh, and I think that health equity has to cross cut everything that we do across the department. So um, I was honored to serve on the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. Um, we voted on recommendations last week. Those recommendations will be going to the president, uh, uh, the president presently, and uh, that will, you know, bring this health equity lens to all of our response to COVID-19. Um, in addition, um, I'm co-chair of the Health Disparities Task Force for the secretary, and we're looking really at every division of how we can make sure that they are incorporating those principles of equity, inclusion, and diversity. Um, in addition, uh, we are continuing to see a, a startling rise now in the amount of drug overdoses uh, during the pandemic. And the opioid crisis, now we're really referring to it as the overdose crisis, um, continues. This is something I worked extensively on as the Physician General and Secretary of Health in Pennsylvania. And so we actually just released our overdose prevention strategy with four pillars the first pillar is prevention. The second pillar is harm reduction. The third is treatment and the fourth is recovery. And, um, uh, and so I'm very pleased to work with, with, with uh, the Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use, Dr. Delphin Rittman, um, on, on all of those different issues. And then of course, across, across the department. There are other mental health issues uh, that we have to deal with, pediatric mental health issues, suicide, and, and so we, I am also co-chair of the Behavioral Health Coordinating Committee uh, for the Secretary with Dr. Delphin Rittman, and we're looking at all of those issues. Finally, I wanna emphasize the risks from climate change. 
and uh, I am, uh, we have just formed a new office, uh, the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity. Uh, that was formed within the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health uh, uh, maybe a month, a month or so ago. Uh, uh, Interim Director Dr. John Balbus, uh, working with our Policy um, uh, Director Arsenio Mataka, are working on, on those issues. And I am actually going to COP. Um, so uh, tonight, I actually leave for Scotland and for Glasgow uh, to represent the Secretary and Health and Human Services at the, uh, at the Climate Change Conference. You know, climate change is not just an existential health threat. This is a health threat now. We are seeing um, threats uh, due to heat in the Southwest, threats from heat in the Northwest in Seattle. We're seeing the impact of forest fires and smoke. We're seeing the impact on, on our weather and hurricanes and flooding go from New Orleans to Tennessee to New Jersey. And so uh, we have to look at this climate change also with a health equity lens, because it's the same people that face those health disparities. And that's what our new office is going to do. And those are the type of issues that I'll be emphasizing when I go to COP26 in Scotland. Thank you so much, and uh, what a tremendous overview of the the issues that you're you're really facing. And um, so, I'd love to ask a couple of follow up questions, and then open it up sure. to our our uh, reporter audience. So, um, so on uh, while we're on climate change, since that's where we ended, you know, this seems to me like the the really the the first time that the climate change and health intersection has really been elevated at the national level. Um, would you say that's true? And 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 specifically. You know, are, are there specific policy actions that you're hoping mm -hmm. um, can be taken, uh, you know, kind of understanding that the broader energy policy is, is sort of um, perhaps in a different realm, but are there specific policy uh, changes that you're hoping to see uh, in that regard? Well, yes, thank you for that question. So, um, yes, this is really the first office dedicated to that intersection um, between climate change and health with that particular lens of health equity. So, you know, the mission of the new office is to protect the health of those most burdened by the health impacts of climate change. Um, the office will have three main areas of work. Uh, the first is to work on building resilience um, to, to the impacts of climate change among health systems and in our, our, our greater um, healthcare community. Um, that, includes, um, that includes hospitals, but also would include um, uh, nursing homes and, and other health and clinics, et cetera. Um, so we're gonna be working closely with our regional offices uh, to tailor solutions to each region's unique needs. The second is working with the nation's hospitals and health systems to actually reduce their greenhouse gas emissions in addition to making them more resilient to the effects of climate change. Actually, the U.S. health sector accounts for approximately 8.5% of U.S. carbon emissions. Globally, that's around 4.5%. So it's critically important to the president's goal of meeting the economy-wide greenhouse gas reductions by 2030 to deal with the health sector. And so this office was created directly in response to President Biden's executive order about tackling climate change at home and abroad. And those are the type of issues that we're gonna be um, talking about at COP26. I would highlight that um, the National Academy of Medicine um, uh, has a, a task force working on this specific issue. I'm proud to, to be one of the co-chairs of that task force. And we're looking specifically at resilience in the healthcare sector, and then working with health systems to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. That's that's very helpful, um, and I, I'm sure there will be more questions about that um, for, from our audience. Um, so, going back to the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force, uh, which did release um, recommendations, can you give us some insight into that report? Uh, what the recommendations are, and again, um, where you see where you see those going. Well, um, the report um, has not formally been released because it has to go to the president first. And so uh, presently, I don't have the exact date. It will be presented to the president and then uh, the report will be released. Um, and then we will, um, we will uh, await the White House's determination about the implementation of that report. And I'm sure that uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, working under Secretary Becerra's leadership, will have quite a role 
in terms of the implementation of those issues. So um, I, I can't really talk about the specifics of the report, um, but uh, the, the recommendations were, were great. They were discussed um, broadly during the meeting uh, in terms of last week, in terms of some broad um, uh, uh, categories of recommendations, uh, but the specific recommendations will be coming out after they're released to the president, given to the president. Great, thank you so much. Well, let me open this up for questions. Uh, we, we, again, so appreciate you being here and uh, being um, willing to answer questions from, uh, from our reporter audience today. Um, so um, friends in our audience, if you um, want to, you can use the raise hand feature, um, or if you're having trouble with that, just send a chat uh, and then you can, we'll put you in a queue and you can unmute yourself and ask your question. And I see um, any, any questions yet from our audience? I, I can keep asking questions. <laughs> um, let, let me, while, while, while folks are kind of thinking about their questions and, and um, maybe Admiral Levine, you, you would, you know, maybe there's some things that you'd like to elaborate on and I'd love to give you the opportunity to do that. Um, but, but I, again, um, let, let, let's, let's talk about climate change again and this idea of resilience. And, you know, since you're, you're working with the Public Health Commission Corps, like, do you see, um, do you think that there will be more of a focus as we think about the uh, resilience of the public health system and the resilience of, you know, um, the healthcare system sort of writ large and, and sort of thinking about them in the context of national emergencies going forward? Do you think that's going to be um, an area of focus for you, um, for your office and, and more broadly? So I do. Um, I, I think that uh, unfortunately, as the impacts of climate change um, are felt in the United States and certainly globally, we are going to see more impacts upon public health, unfortunately, more emergencies. They'll take many forms. Uh, they could be in terms of sea level rise and the impact upon communities. Uh, they could be increasing in, in severe weather events, um, such as some of the hurricanes that we saw, uh, some of the flooding uh, that was seen through large parts of the country, which has obviously significant health impacts. I, we will see that with heat related problems. We're going to see it in terms of forest fires and, and more. One thing in which, which we see is an impact actually on, on infectious diseases and vector borne diseases, you know, um, uh, in terms of the risk of, of Zika virus, which is because of spread of mosquitoes, which has to do with um, warming trends due to climate change. And so uh, that impacts our communities as well. Um, I do think that there'll be a role for um, our Public Health Service Commission Corps to pitch in and to be able to, uh, to help with those, but we need to anticipate some of those and build in resilience to our healthcare system. Um, for example, um, you know, many of the hospitals in New Orleans fared much better when Hurricane Ida hit because of, of uh, building in resilience into that system than they did under Katrina because they, they were, were built to withstand some of those challenges, um, that they had uh, better preparation. I mean, we'll need to think about that throughout the United States. That's just one example. Thank you. That's a great example. So uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, we have Robert King, and I'll ask you to unmute yourself, state your affiliation, and um, ask your question. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. I'm with uh, Fierce Healthcare. I had a question about uh, what what hospitals' role is going to be in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about what requirements HHS is you know, pondering for hospitals to get them to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Could it be that, could their Medicare reimbursements potentially be affected if they're not able to kind of, you know, do their part in this, uh, mm -hmm. in this effort? Well, first, we want to work with the health systems, and we're, we're working to get buy-in. And that's that involved our very important stakeholder work with the National Academy of Medicine. Um, so we've had a number of different meetings um, with the leaders of, of, of very large health systems, um, some of whom are on, on, on that uh, steering committee, uh, to, to be able to voluntarily work to decrease their, their carbon emissions. And that's going to take Many different forms uh, it's going to take uh, in terms of their utilization of energy um, at the hospital, in terms of the, um, uh, of the distribution of, uh, um, of many of their materials that come to the, uh, um, they, they come to the hospital. So lots of different roles. Uh, we will be looking across health and human services at what regulatory levers 
we might be able to use uh, just to encourage um, uh, health systems to do that. Those can, the regulatory um, levers can be uh, with CMS. They might be with other um, divisions, but none of that is officially decided. That's all of what we're going to be looking at with our new office. Thank you for the, for the answer to that question, Admiral Levine. Um, Debbie Kaplan is next. Ms. Kaplan, if you could. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, I'm Debbie Kaplan. I freelance for a number of different healthcare um, publications, and I actually had the same question as Robert King, but maybe we can try to um, drill down a little bit more. And instead of looking at what kinds of regulatory efforts there might be, maybe talking about um, specific areas in which um, you're finding carbon emissions in the healthcare system overall and what kinds of ideas and solutions um, the, the government might be recommending. I know you mentioned already about supply chain and distribution as well as energy use at the hospital. There's lots of other things in terms of whether, you know, looking at the food that is served at hospitals, um, which is just one other area you didn't mention, but and, and probably a smaller one, but um, I was hoping you might be able to just talk a little bit more in, in specifics about some of the ideas or things that the government's thinking about. Well, uh, again, um, many of these discussions are us working with the stakeholders, um, because I think that you're going to find a, a significant buy-in by um, um, many of the uh, health systems in terms of this. I mean, they realize the uh, the impact of climate change that it has now and is going to have in the future. So I think a lot of these measures are going to be voluntary. I think a lot of them are going to be, uh, will actually um, help them in terms of their bottom line. And um, so I think that that um, it's going to also going to be regional. So I think that the challenges for the Southwest will be very different than in terms of, uh, of heat um, related issues will be very different than it is um, in the East on the coast where, you know, in Florida or in South Carolina and North Carolina, where, you know, sea level rise is going to be more important. Um, in, in the, in the, uh, the Mid-South, in New Orleans, both from sea level rise, but also in terms of, uh, of hurricanes, et cetera. So it's going to have to be regional. It's going to be, have to be tailored to the specific issues of those health systems. And then uh, as we work with them as stakeholders, um, we're going to look um, within health and human services to see how we can help. Uh, and again, how we can use, um, you know, hopefully positive regulatory levers um, and positive inducements to be able to uh, to, to encourage this work. Um, I don't have a lot of specifics now because those discussions are happening as we speak. I, we, I mean, there was one of the National Academy meetings this week um, with stakeholders and, and hospitals and health systems. I mean, at the table are major stakeholders. I mean, um, the AMA, the American Hospital Association, specific hospitals and health systems. I think we want to collaborate and work together because they see the need both to develop resiliency in the, in the health sector, as well as decrease their carbon emissions. Thank you, Admiral Levine, uh, for that question. And um, there is someone who was having trouble with uh, the chat. Um, and let me make sure I get that name um, for you all. Um, Jimmy, I believe. Um, Jimmy. Yes, we're talking about health. Okay. Admiral, I want to. Are you ready? I'll try to keep this, I've got a long run, but I'll try to keep this short. Admiral, over a decade ago, as part of the Affordable Care Act, uh, the Reauthorization Act, and in Health Service was part of that. And in there, it provided for the establishment of an Office of Indian Women's Health and Indian Men's Health. And the pandemic seems to point out the overwhelming need to establish those offices so they can speak more directly to the people that this pandemic is really hurting in Indian, in Indian country. We were wondering if there's any plans by this administration to go ahead and name someone of those offices. We've written a number of things about it. I was trying to put that in the chat. I seem to be having some problems. I'll try again. But are there any plans to go ahead and establish those two offices? The way our friends at the Indian Health Service tell us that all they would have to do is shift some responsibilities around and name a person over the women's office and one over the men's office. Thank you. 
Well, thank you for highlighting the, the, the fantastic work that is done by the Indian Health Service um, and the importance of that work. Um, I would point out that there are many uh, members of the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps uh, that serve in their details at the Indian Health Service, providing direct patient care, um, as you said, in Indian country. Um, and so um, Indian Health Service is, is absolutely critically important. Um, the Indian Health Service is not under my authority. It is not part of the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. So I actually do not have granular detail about maybe some of the people that they might plan to appoint or some of the offices that they, that they might be um, looking at. Um, but I do know um, the importance of the office, the importance of the office to the secretary, uh, the importance of the office in terms of um, the health equity issues uh, that we have been discussing, because clearly the American Indian Native Alaskan community has been one of the communities that has suffered um, disproportionately in terms of health disparities in our nation. Um, and from health disparities for COVID-19, but then many health disparities for acute and chronic illnesses. So um, I am pleased that always to collaborate um, uh, um, and to work with the Indian Health Service um, and, uh, and to make sure, of course, that our officers are, are well deployed there. I do not know the answer to that specific question, however. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral Levine. And for those who are interested, um, the Alliance will be doing a broader uh, briefing, actually two briefings that might be of interest, one on Native American um, Indigenous health, as, as well as one on environmental health um, in the coming months. So I'm sorry to put in a plug right there, but <laughs> since we've been on the topic, thought that might be of interest. Um, okay, we have a question from Sarah Ormel. Um, Sarah, if you could unmute yourself and state your affiliation, please. Thanks. Hi. Um, thank you, Dr. Levine. I'm Sarah Ormel from Politico. Um, I want to shift gears a bit to the opioid crisis. There's um, been shown a tra upwards trajectory in cases and, uh, or sorry, overdoses and deaths during the pandemic. Um, how is the Biden administration thinking about tackling that? Is it going to be, you know, the same strategies that have been employed before? Are you thinking of new ways to um, address this, especially again, because of the barriers that the pandemic has presented? Well, thank you for that question. And you are entirely correct. Uh, we are seeing a significant rise in drug overdoses. Um, provisional data from the CDC show that drug overdose deaths have accelerated during the pandemic. Uh, the most recent data shows that well over 95,000 people have died from overdose deaths in the 12 month period ending March, 2021. That's, that's the highest number of overdose deaths ever recorded in a 12 month period. And you know we know that um, that uh, because of COVID nineteen, but even before that, people in America have faced barriers navigating our behavioral health system and our substance use uh, tr treatment system. So we want to eliminate those barriers. We want to expand access uh, to a full range of services. So again, we have four pillars. The first pillar is prevention. There are a number of different aspects of prevention. Uh, that includes community based prevention that SAMHSA works on. That includes um, school-based prevention efforts that SAMHSA also uh, uh, works on. And of course, uh, they fund uh, the state's efforts on those issues uh, through the SOR funding. Um, in addition, um, uh, we, we are working on what I have called is opioid stewardship. Opioid stewardship. The parallel is to antibiotic stewardship. And that is working with the medical community to, to prescribe opioids very carefully and judiciously. So just like antibiotics, opioids are necessary. And so if you had a major operation this morning or you're in a tragic accident and you're in the emergency department, you would need an opioid for acute pain. And if you have cancer or pain or end of life pain, palliative care, you will need an opioid. But clearly opioids have been overprescribed uh, for mild to moderate acute and chronic pain. And that is one of the one of the factors that has led originally to, to the opioid crisis. So we need to continue that work. Uh, we had done that work in Pennsylvania and had decreased opioid prescriptions 50% in the, in the time that I was there uh, through, through that education efforts in many different points of view. Uh, the CDC is working on, um, on new expanded um, opioid prescribing guidelines. I know the FDA um, has a role in that as does NIDA uh, and my office and SAMHSA. So we all work in this collaborative way on prevention efforts. The second is harm reduction. 
Now, we're thinking of harm reduction very broadly. We're thinking of harm reduction that includes naloxone distribution and administration. That's something also I worked on in, in Pennsylvania. And naloxone is an absolute life-saving medication um, in a nasal spray. Uh, that, can, that can be used uh, to reverse an opioid overdose. In addition, we're thinking of fentanyl strips because one of the, 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 the risks right now and the DEA and, and ONDCP have emphasized this are the synthetic fentanyl compounds, the extremely powerful fent synthetic fentanyl compounds that have been coming into the United States. Now, one of the biggest risks are highlighted by the DEA are fentanyl um, uh, is synthetic fentanyls that are pressed into little pills that might look like oxycodone pills. They might look like um, benzodiazepine pills or other pills. Um, and they're indistinguishable from the actual medication, which poses a significant risk. So fentanyl strips are harm reduction efforts so that people can, can, um, can know that they might be taking fentanyl and hopefully avoid the medication, the, the, the drug, or, um, or be prepared. The third are syringe service programs. Our administration is strongly supportive of syringe service programs which can serve to save lives, uh, prevent HIV and hepatitis, but also to distribute naloxone and to connect people to treatment. So we're gonna be working on that. The third pillar is treatment. So for the disease of addiction to opioids, that includes uh, medication for opioid use disorder, sometimes called medication assisted treatment, but more now called medication for opioid use disorder. That includes methadone, buprenorphine medications, as well as the injectable long-acting naltrexone. We want to make sure, and we have been working to increase distribution of these medicines, and we revised our buprenorphine um, guidelines in terms of the X waiver to make it easier for medical providers to be able to prescribe buprenorphine medications. Um, and then getting people into recovery. I want to highlight, though, that many the overdoses are have many different drugs in them now. They might include stimulants such as methamphetamine or, and or cocaine, maybe laced with fentanyl. And so getting people into treatment is so important, including medication for opioid use disorder, but there are, there are other treatment modalities to treat patients with a disease of addiction to methamphetamine or cocaine. They need to be emphasized. And we need more research from the NIH and NIDA to, to be able to determine those. So you can see how it's across health and human services working with ONDCP, who establishes the national plan and the DEA on all of these different issues. Thank you, Admiral Levine, for, for that really comprehensive answer. And I just point out, I mean, this has been such a longstanding issue and a, a very bipartisan issue, one that was a priority for, for the last Ash and the last administration, just, you know, and I remember all the way back to my days on the Hill even, you know, and, and um, I'm just wondering in, in follow-up, like, <laughs> Is there something we need to get to? Is there sort of like an underlying reason for all of this um, that, that, that you are concerned about and, and that you think um, you know, our country can get a better handle on? And sure. That's an unfair question. But <laughs> that's all right. I think that, I think that if you look, if, if you look upstream, um, so a lot of the underlying issues relate to what we call the social determinants of health. And those are those, those, those um, so issues, those social issues that we don't always think about as health issues, but to me, they are health issues. So uh, economic opportunity and a living wage, those are health issues, because we know that poverty is associated with addiction and poverty is associated with bad health outcomes. Um, uh, uh, the uh, educational opportunities is a health issue. Transportation is a health issue. Housing is absolutely a health issue. Nutrition, of course, the environment we've been talking about, all of those are, are health issues. I mean, you can think of um, often addiction as, as diseases of despair, dis diseases when there, there's, no other, um, there's no other opportunity. And so we have to go upstream to those social determinants of health. We have to do that to build um, um, recovery and, to, and resilience as we come out of COVID-19. I mean, that is why COVID-19 really has seemed to exacerbate the overdose crisis, which we we were making some progress in 2018 and 2019, but in 2020, associated with the COVID-19 um, illness um, among loved ones, death among loved ones, um, uh, challenges in terms of the economy, um, challenges in terms of social isolation it is really one of the strong factors that has exacerbated the overdose crisis. So we're going to need to work on all of those at the same time as we emphasize our four pillars of our overdose strategy. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that, uh, that additional follow-up um, and a call for community if there ever was one. Um, thank you. So we have Alexander Tin and then Nancy Finn. Um, Alexander, go ahead. Hi, thanks for uh, taking my question. Um, just a question on the vaccine confidence campaign, you know, on the concern that we might see the same kind of vaccination disparities in the COVID rollout that we see, you know, in some other childhood vaccinations. Uh, I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about the department's outreach progress so far on that specific population, both in terms of, you know, the trusted messengers that the Surgeon General mentioned, but also any new paid media or grants we should expect? Mm -hmm. Well, this is a very important issue. Uh, vaccine um, hesitancy in general uh, for regular childhood vaccines, for example, and as related to the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, you know, if you look back, I mean, it shows the importance of research integrity, which is one of our offices, is that a lot of current vaccine hesitancy goes back to the late 90s. And this was an article by Dr. Wakefield in Great Britain, who wrote an article alleging that there was an association between the measles vaccine and autism. Now, um, that really was one of the impetus of, of a lot of vaccine hesitancy that we see uh, that has that has increased uh, during uh, this uh, during this century. Um, that article was fo uh, found to be falsified, and the data was fabricated. And the article was taken off the Lancet and he was um, you know, uh, expelled from the medical society, but the damage was done. Um, there have been numerous articles since that time that shows that there is absolutely no association between the measles vaccine or the MMR vaccine and autism. But you know, concerns persist uh, because of misinformation, um, which has spread you know, through various media forms, but particularly through social media. Well, this has just been heightened uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we need to work past that misinformation. And our, our wonderful Surgeon General, Vice Admiral Murthy, um, has been working in terms of trying to counter misinformation. And it's, it's critically important now um, with the COVID-19 vaccine for children. So we have an, a safe and effective vaccine for COVID-19 for children, the Pfizer vaccine. It has undergone rigorous review. It has been authorized under the FDA. It has been recommended now by the CDC. And we are working really closely. In fact, I was on a webinar last night uh, with the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Family Physicians, you know, who, who you know, really are trusted community stakeholders and trusted community voices uh, to be able to talk about the safety of the vaccine and the importance of the distribution and administration of these childhood vaccines. Um, it is not true that children have not been impacted by COVID-19. I mean, we have seen hundreds of thousands of children um, uh, and, and more who have been, uh, who have been infected with COVID-19, several million actually, but we have also seen um, thousands and thousands of children that have been hospitalized, some quite ill, due to COVID-19, um, and tragically, children that have, that have died from COVID-19. Well, this is now a vaccine-preventable illness, and we don't want any child, in fact, we don't want anybody to get extremely ill or die from a vaccine-preventable illness. So we're going to work um, through paid media. We're going to work through um, other media outlets. We're going to work with you all, you know, our, our nation's reporters um, and press on this. We want to uh, work with, with our community core, and the Surgeon General has had a lot of contact with trusted community stakeholders, whether that is pediatricians and family physicians, whether that is children's hospitals or other hospitals, whether that is business leaders or faith leaders, to get the message out about the safety and the effectiveness and the importance of these vaccines. And that's what we're going to do. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and now we turn to Nancy Finn. Uh, Nancy, if you could unmute and state your affiliation, please. Hi. So uh, I want to thank you so much for this incredibly informative session. Um, my question is kind of a broad one, and it is related again to climate change. What is the thinking about the relationship between climate change and pandemics? And what are next steps to establish protocols to address this challenge to the health and well being of our patient populations? Well, thank you for highlighting it. There is a relationship to climate change um, and the risk of pandemics. I mean, we know that one of the factors involved with climate change, for example, um, is deforest deforestation. 
Um, and I know that actually the, 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 at COP26, the president and, and other world leaders were discussing um, limiting deforestation. And there were some agreements um, that, that were signed. Um, because as you, 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 uh, you do that, you're bringing um, actually um, people more and more in contact with other, uh, other animals, other flora and fauna um, in, in those, uh, especially those rainforests. Um, and we know that you know, when you bring uh, the, uh, people into contact with, with uh, animals that they don't usually see, that is a risk for something like pandemic. So whether it is, you know, uh, various animals such as bats. I mean, we know. I mean, we so we we know that 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 SARS uh, was a bat-related uh, um, illness that that uh, was transmitted to people. We know that MERS was was uh, uh, I think I believe bats to camel-related illness that went to people. We do not know the origins of SARS-CoV-2, the the virus associated with COVID-19, um, but it is very similar to certain bat viruses. So you as you as you increase that contact, that increases the risk of, of something like uh, these viruses spreading and the risk of pandemics. And but there are other infections, as I mentioned, particularly vector-borne inf infections. You know, Lyme disease in Pennsylvania, which is very impacted by Lyme disease, was only in a certain area in the southeast of Pennsylvania um, a number of decades ago. And now every single county in Pennsylvania has the tick associated with Lyme disease. Um, uh, uh, and uh, also has cases of Lyme disease. And we think that that's associated with our warming, um, our, our, our global warming associated with climate change. So as we see ticks, as we see mosquitoes spread because of, of war our warming climate, that can increase the risk of the transmission of of infections, you know the the um, uh, the different mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti, etc., that are primarily we think of as tropical or semi-tropical, are coming north because of the, our warming climate. So many different illnesses are impacted by the risks of climate change. Thank you so much for that for that response. And I I want to ask you, I mean, do you think, um, Admiral Levine, that our medical training or public health training needs to change as a result to prepare for this? Like, or, or is it more about having um, kind of on the ground resources to identify emerging infectious diseases as they occur? I know this kind of goes to the pandemic preparedness question again, but I, I am curious um, your thoughts on, on how this might affect training going forward. Well, I do think that, that COVID-19, but also many of the issues that we've been talking about will need to be reflected in medical training. Now, I mean, coming from academic medicine and spending, you know, my really almost entire career at Mount Sinai and then at Penn State um, College of Medicine, I mean, I understand the challenges because we try to cram in so much information for medical students as well as other medical professionals. It's, it's difficult. But I think that, um, that one, the pandemic has shown us, like nothing else, the importance of public health is that public health is absolutely critical. And I think that it has shown us the necessity for having a robust public health workforce, for having sustainable funding for public health, and for having the IT structure for public health, but also the importance of public health um, education for physicians and other medical professionals, whether that is nurses, whether that is nurse practitioners or PAs. So they're not all gonna become public health um, experts, but I think they're gonna need some training in public health because we can see that with COVID-19. I think they're gonna need some training in terms of, of, of mental health, more training in terms of mental health. And I've discussed this, for example, with, uh, with my pediatric colleagues is that, you know, pediatric mental health and, and actually the AAP the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Children's Hospital Association put out a, um, a you know, a, a crisis alert in terms of pediatric mental health is that pediatricians and family physicians are going to have to get more training in terms of basic mental health. I mean, we simply do not have enough psychiatrists. We don't have enough child and adolescent psychiatrists and psychologists, and we'll need to train more, but that training takes time. So I think that they're going to have to have more training and expertise I think we need more programs such as uh, Project ECHO, which is an online training module uh, developed uh, in, by the University of New Mexico um, uh, for, for training in terms of rural areas, uh, more, um, more um, training in terms of telehealth. And then finally, these climate change issues, which impact our health, will need to be included in the curriculum. That is a challenge given how busy the curriculum is now. So it's gonna take time. 
But I think those things will need to be worked on. Thank you so much. Uh, so we have about 15 very precious minutes left in our conversation for today. Um, I just want to ask Robert, Alexander, and Nancy, your hands are still up. So I wasn't sure if you had, if any of you had a follow-up. So let me pause and see if anyone has a follow-up. Um, okay, and barring that, um, let me again invite um, anybody who would like to ask a question to use your raise hand feature or the chat um, to, to ask your question. And I think someone has unmuted. Yes, no, I think it's just me and you, um, um, Admiral. Okay. <laughs> I mean, so, um, well, well, let me ask you this. I mean, you know, we've covered we've covered COVID um, and kids vaccines um, and the vaccine hesitancy, um, some a bit on the misinformation um, and communication issue. Um, you know, um, we've covered health equity. You've talked about opioids and your strategy with with opioids and some of the underlying issues. You know, certainly behavioral health and mental health. And then we've we spent a fair bit of time on climate change. Is there anything that you would like to elaborate on? Sure. Uh, two things. Um, uh, and they, they relate together. But um, overall, um, as part of health equity, uh, reproductive health equity. Um, and so uh, the uh, Office of Population Affairs is within the, uh, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, and that includes the Title X program. And so we have just uh, in the last month or so uh, promulgated new rules uh, for Title X. Uh, and we have uh, actually putting out um, NOFOs, um, uh, requests for, you know, opportunities for funding uh, for Title 10 now. And I think that 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 is a health equity issue. I think that that we have to have um, a robust uh, reproductive health program um, in, in, in our country for, for, for example, adolescents and for, um, for vulnerable communities. One of the victories of public health um, over the last 30 or more years has been the consistent decline in the unintended pregnancy rate and the consistent decline in the adolescent pregnancy rate um, for, compared to when I was in training, which was actually in the 80s, to now, when I'm, you know, my field is pediatrics, but also adolescent medicine, the medical care of teens and, and young adults, we have had consistent declines. Well, that is due uh, to, the, the, to the significant advances of the Teenage Pregnancy Prevention Program, the Title X program, comprehensive um, sex education in the schools, et cetera, which have produced that. And so there were uh, challenges in the previous administration. Uh, and so we are working to, as the president says, build back better uh, those reproductive health programs. Uh, the other that I'd like to emphasize is, um, is our work on ending the HIV epidemic. Um, and our coordination with the White House um, uh, National HIV Strategy. You know, I, I started my residency program in pediatrics at Mount Sinai Hospital in Manhattan in 1983. In 1983, we started to see babies who had opportunistic infections, infections you would not expect a healthy baby to have, and they would all die. And then I would see their mothers develop those opportunistic infections, and they would all pass away, they would all die. Sometimes their fathers would die and what they had was HIV and AIDS. And then in adolescent medicine, I would see teens who contracted HIV in a number of different ways um, and they would all die. There was nothing we could do for them. It was absolutely heartbreaking to see those patients. Uh, and then now we have outstanding, through outstanding research, um, uh, medications that can treat HIV, we don't have a cure, but can treat HIV so that it is a, a, a chronic illness. And we have medicine, PrEP, that can prevent HIV. And we can have somebody be, be, who might be at risk, we can prevent them from tracking HIV. And we have treatments that someone is U equals U, undetectable equals untransmissible. That would have seemed a miracle when I was in training in the 80s. Yet we still have challenges and that gets back to the social determinants of health. We have to continue to work to make sure that vulnerable communities have access to these medications. And that includes really very complicated issues in terms of housing, in terms of economic opportunity, in terms of reaching those communities. Um, and so we have myriads of stakeholder calls, had a stakeholder call today um, with advocates in the, um, in the HIV uh, treatment com community world. I mean, we, we, we need to continue the work done through the EHE program, um, having it be consistent with and integrated with the national strategy. And so I was there at the beginning 
of the HIV epidemic in 1983, I want to be there at the end. I want to be there at the end of the HIV epidemic. And I think that that is within our potential. That is a, an incredibly inspiring goal. And um, let's hope that we, we get there and get there together. Um, let me ask you, um, if I may follow up, I mean, you know, you talked about sexual and, and gender health. Certainly, you're such a, a champion of yourself and, 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 and also a champion of mental health. And I, I want to ask you particularly about, um, you know, health equity for the LGBTQIA you know, plus community. Um, and, 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 and how do you view the intersectionality there with, with other health equity goals? And, and, and also if you'd like to um, comment on, um, on mental health implications there as well. Well, thank you for that, for that opportunity. Absolutely. Um, so when we think of health equity, we're thinking of health equity for many uh, disadvantaged communities, um, the African-American community, the Latinx community. I mentioned the American Indian Native Alaskan community, but that includes the LGBTQI plus community who has had significant health disparities. Um, and so we want um, to include that community in terms of all of our health equity efforts. One thing that um, HHS has done through our Office of Civil Rights is that they have uh, reinterpreted um, the Affordable Care Act, uh, really very consistent with uh, the, the Obama administration, that when the ACA says that you cannot discriminate on the basis of sex, that that includes sexual orientation and gender identity. And so that really brings the, the, uh, the full bore of, the, of, of those um, policies for the ACA across HHS for the LGBTQI community, that you cannot discriminate on the basis of that. So we're gonna be looking at, um, they're gonna, I know gonna be working on, on that rule, and then we're gonna be looking across HHS and all of the different divisions about how that rule, how that new policy will need to be applied. And I think it is absolutely profound in, in terms of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the need for health services by the LGBTQI community who traditionally have been underserved and have avoided medical care because of their fear of, uh, of discrimination, a well-founded fear of discrimination. Um, many people of the community have felt that they have suffered um, discrimination from their medical providers. And so we need to build back better and we need to improve, we need to improve that and to make sure that the community has, has health equity. You know, we have made progress in the community. And I, I hope that my appointment and then my commission in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps is a sign of that progress. We have a president that sees us and that advocates for us. And he has articulated that on numerous occasions. But we have to make progress for all in our community. There are particular vulnerable groups within the LGBTQI plus community. That includes youth. That includes seniors. That includes LGBTQ plus immigrants. That includes actually the intersex community itself, which is often not, not fully included. It particularly includes LGBTQI individuals of color and transgender individuals of color, trans women of color are at risk not only of discrimination or bullying, they are at risk of, of violence and murder. So we have to make progress for all of us in the community, for all members of our community, that's what we're gonna do across, across the administration. And we need to push back against um, um, uh, regressive laws that have, been, uh, that have been used, I think for political purposes in, in many states that are targeting vulnerable trans youth. And instead of supporting and advocating them, are, are advocating for them, are limiting their access to to activities and sports, or, or even limiting their the availability of standard of care medical treatment. And so, you know, we need to push back against that at HHS. I know the Department of Justice will push back at that against that because we're really focused on equity, diversity, and inclusion. Equity, diversity, and inclusion. Thank you so so much for your, your response to that question, Admiral Levine. And, and let me ask you one, one substantive follow-up, and then I want to ask you a closing question. Um, you know, there's been, um, I think, a lot of conversation in the policy community around data and how um, the data infrastructure just writ large 
impacts, you know, um, racial and ethnic, um, uh, you know, health disparities, but also certainly um, sexual and gender identity health disparities too. And, and I'm curious if you um, or your office are, are part of um, any of those efforts on um, kind of looking at the data infrastructure. So we are, and, and you know, um, uh, many of the, at the Health Disparities Council um, uh, across HHS, as well as the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force, and our discussions in the LGBTQI plus community, um, we have discussed that, is that without data, you're invisible. You can become invisible. Well, we can't let any vulnerable community become invisible. So we can't, in uh, communities of color, the LGBTQI plus community, the intersections of those communities, we can't let any community become invisible. And so data is absolutely critically important and, and disaggregated data is very important. And so we need, it's, it's a long-term project, but we need to continue to work about that across the Department of Health and Human Services and really across the administration. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we only have about five minutes left. And so this, I'm gonna ask you a question that I love to ask of, of our leaders who come, come to these, um, these forums. And um, this is not specifically a question for the reporters, but it's a question for, uh, for you um, about uh, the, the sort of the future of public health leadership of our country. You know, as, as people, um, as, as public health students, as medical students, kind of people thinking about entering the field, today um, look to you and to your career, what advice would you have for them? Well, a, a number of pieces of advice. Um, first is, um, you know, um, I never thought that I would end up here. I mean, you know, I, I was fully ensconced in academic medicine at Penn State and then had the opportunity to join Governor Wolf's administration as the physician general and the secretary, and then uh, the amazing opportunity to, to, to become the assistant secretary for health. So I think it's important for students uh, to be really flexible um, and, and to, take, uh, to take advantage of opportunities when they come um, and to uh, be open to, to many different uh, opportunities and many different paths. Um, I think that COVID-19 has shown the importance of public health like nothing else. Public health is it's like the center of the universe, you know, right now. Um, I used to say Brooklyn was the center of the universe because, you know, mostly we think of Brooklyn. Uh, but actually, I think it's public health right now that is, is, is really. And so I, that's why I think that whether someone becomes, you know, gets a master's or goes into public health, we need public health education. Um, for our students, again, whether that's medical students or other medical professionals, uh, because we have shown how critical things are. You know, I'm a positive and optimistic person, uh, and I think that um, that that we're going to come out of the co through and then out of the COVID-19 pandemic stronger. I think with the president's leadership, with the secretary's leadership, with the public health leadership that we have um, in the federal government, but also fantastic public health leadership that we have among the states and in, and in local health departments. I think that we are collaborating together like never before and public health will come out stronger. Um, and be better prepared for the complex future that awaits us. Well, thank you so much, Admiral Levine. Uh, you have been incredibly generous with your time and with your insights. And uh, we thank you for being here with us. Uh, we wish you safe travels to um, uh, safe travels abroad to the climate conference. And um, thank you again. Th thank you very much. Take care. Thanks, you too. And thank you to APCO Worldwide for your partnership. And, and finally, of course, um, to all of our, our, our friends in the audience um, from the, the journalist community, you, um, you all, as Bill said, really carry forward our democracy and uh, we're grateful for your work. So um, again, thank you, Admiral Levine, and thank you, Bill. Thank you.